For most of the growing season, Kip Tom has been hard at work on his farm. But he's not planting corn and soybeans with his hands or weeding out invasive plants with a stirrup hoe. Instead, the 59-year-old farmer is on his computer, monitoring and analyzing data streams that are pouring off of the sensors around his 20,000-acre farm. For Tom, much like most farmers in imperial core countries like the United States, sowing fields with crops is a multi-million dollar gamble. Because the 21st century farm looks nothing like its pastoral ancestor. It's highly mechanized, steeped in market forces, and coated in fossil fuels. So how did we get here? How did our food systems transform from supplying food to regional hubs to ones that leverage the latest technologies and massive amounts of fuels to get the highest price on the global commodity market? When did we stop growing food and start growing products? Today we dive into the Imperial Corps' industrial food system in order to uncover some answers to those very questions, and figure out whether there's actually a way to feed the world with food that nourishes both humans and the planet. This video is better on Nebula. Use the link in the description below to support our changing climate directly by signing up for Nebula. There you can watch this video ad-free and also watch over 25 OCC videos that I haven't released on YouTube, including next month's video on the history of how capitalism created the climate crisis. The world needs a lot of food. Every day, 8 billion people consume thousands of calories just to survive, which means that farms, the very place where we harness the power of the sun to nurture life, are crucial to our survival. Today's farms, however, look like this. Massive fields of crops as far as the eye can see. And in the United States, farms like these usually grow two plants, soybeans and corn. At first glance, you might think that these farms are feeding the world. Yes, these fields of green are growing crops, but they aren't necessarily for human consumption. Most corn and soybean is converted into everything from biofuels to animal feed. Indeed, the average corn farm in the US is now over 700 acres, and across the country, 38% of the corn grown is converted to ethanol for fuel, while another 38% gets processed into animal feed. So the majority of the 767 billion pounds of corn that American farmers grew in 2022 wasn't made to feed the mouths of the hungry. It went instead into the mouths of cows and into the gas tanks of cars. So when someone says that we need this farming system in order to feed the world, they're wrong. The industrial farm system's main focus is commodity crops to fuel our transport and our animals. Its focus is not food that we can put directly in our mouths. In part, this is because farming has increasingly been engulfed by our global capitalist economy. Agribusinesses and farmers are no longer focused on growing food for humans to eat, but instead they are producing commodities that can, hopefully, turn them a profit. This process of seeking more value from every acre planted has led to a veritable arms race on industrial farms, one that pushes growers to get bigger and more specialized. These days, in order to produce all that corn and soybean, farms have been kitted out with a whole range of technologies. Technologies like herbicide-resistant genetically modified seeds that allow growers to indiscriminately spray chemicals on their crops, or synthetic fertilizers that help farmers mask the need for healthy soil, or $500,000 combine harvesters that dramatically decreased harvest time through mechanization. While there is nothing wrong with these technologies in theory, indeed minimizing the need for backbreaking labor is crucial. We will soon see that they enable and entrap farmers into a narrow vision of agriculture, a monoculture commodity farm that has devastating consequences for the planet. Growing food has increasingly been wrapped up in the forces of capitalist commodity production. And as our food transformed from sustenance grown for our survival to products sold for profit, so too did our farms, to the point where the very food we eat drips with oil and fossil fuels. In 2013, a warehouse in West Texas exploded with brutal force. Injuring over 160 people and killing 15, the explosion wasn't an act of terror or a bombing. It was instead caused by our current food system. The warehouse was full of fertilizer. More specifically, ammonium nitrate, one of the most used chemical nutrients for growing plants across the world and also a core ingredient for bombs. The very stuff we sow into our soil is the very stuff we use to sow seeds of destruction. But as much as modern agriculture and agribusiness is born out of chemicals of war, it also has another toxic muse. 
oil, and gas. Fossil fuels are intimately intertwined with every level of our food system, to the extent that oil shocks from the Russian-Ukraine war shock our agriculture directly. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine could see international food and feed prices rise by up to 20%. But why is our farming system so closely linked with fossil fuels? You might think it would be the plethora of gas-guzzling machines now required to grow and transport crops. But that's only a slice of the fossil fuel demands of industrial agriculture. The real culprit is synthetic fertilizer, specifically nitrogen fertilizer, which accounts for roughly 56% of all fertilizers used worldwide. The very same substance that packed that Texas warehouse before it blew up. Nitrogen fertilizer is synthesized through what's called the Haber-Bosch process, an extremely energy-intensive operation that converts hydrogen into ammonia, which is then combined with carbon dioxide to create urea to spread over soil for plant production. While it might sound like a relatively harmless and straightforward process, under the hood, this operation drips in greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuels. 98% of the hydrogen used during the fertilizer creation process is derived from fossil gas and coal, which means that quite literally, the very nutrients we put into our soils are products of the fossil fuel industry. And the ammonia conversion process itself produces an estimated 450 million tons of CO2 per year. And that's just the start. After all this chemical fertilizer is produced by chemical companies, it's pushed onto farmers who spray that fertilizer indiscriminately across their fields. And when that nitrogen makes contact with the soil, it releases nitrous oxide, a gas that has a warming potential 265 times that of carbon dioxide. Indeed, the emissions from nitrogen fertilizer synthesis, use, and transport accounts for 2.1% of all total global greenhouse gas emissions, which is roughly the same as all of the aviation sector. Yet farmers continue to pump more and more fertilizer onto their soils. Stripped of nutrients and organic matter from minimal crop rotation and constant chemical interventions, soils ruined by commodity production force farmers onto a vicious treadmill. The more they till, the more they spray, and the more they leave their fields uncovered, the more fertilizer they will have to inject into the dirt next season. So every year they need a larger amount of fertilizer, one of the few factors under their control, to get their next big yield. Indeed, nitrogen fertilizer production has increased tenfold over the last 60 years. And the capitalist profiting off of these chemicals are the very same accumulating wealth from planetary destruction. One study on the connection between the fossil fuel industry and agrochemical companies found that seven of eight companies examined showed extensive past or current ties to the fossil fuel industry through board interlocks, corporate ownership structures, or direct engagement in fossil fuel production. The companies making fertilizer are the very same companies extracting fossil fuels. This is concerning, especially when considering that nitrogen fertilizer production has increased 900% from 12.9 million tons in 1961 to 123 million tons in 2020. So much like oil-derived plastics, synthetic fertilizers are a gold mine for fossil fuel companies. Under attack from climate initiatives and carbon cutting policies, fossil capitalists are looking to maintain profits by funneling their fuels into our soils and food. In their study on fossil fuel-derived fertilizers, the Center for International Environmental Law puts it bluntly. The fertilizer and fossil fuel industries are increasingly collaborating to launder fossil fuels, particularly gas, as an ever-expanding source of both clean energy and clean agrochemicals. It is neither. In a world where the UN Food and Agriculture Organization projects nitrogen fertilizer use might grow by 50% by 2050, this is concerning. As farms increasingly become factories, their ties with the fossil fuel industry become tighter. In some instances, literally protecting and perpetuating the fossil economy. Like in the case of the US agribusiness's long history of blocking climate policies through aggressive lobbying. According to Inside Climate News, the Farm Bureau, which is industrial agriculture's lobbying appendage, helped block the Senate ratification of the Kyoto Protocol in 1999, opposed the American Clean Energy and Security Act 10 years later, and backed legislation that would prevent the EPA from regulating greenhouse gases. And outside of policy, roughly two-thirds of oil and gas is produced on leased-out farmland. In short, where you find industrial agriculture, you'll find oil and vice versa. But this isn't the inevitable conclusion of growing food. Instead, it is driven by the logic of capitalism, forces that push farmers to consolidate, exploit, and commodify the plants and animals that sustain our lives. 
If we take a trip back to the farm of Kip Tom, we can see the logical conclusion of a farming system operating within a capitalist market system. Tom Farms manages an immense amount of information through its cloud computing system. It's all geared towards increasing yield. According to the New York Times, Tom's farm consists of 20,000 acres of corn and soybean harvested by GPS-driven combines. And data trackers are everywhere, giving minute-to-minute -minute reads on irrigation levels and soil fertility. For Tom, a seventh-generation farmer in the US, this is now what it takes to stay competitive and profitable. An increasingly mechanized and technology-laden farm that is specialized on just two crops to eke out as much profit as possible from each harvest. As professor of plant and soil science Fred Magnoff writes, agriculture under capitalism is highly irrational. Instead of seeking its core mission to feed people, our food system is now built around profit and the exchange of products. And the most profitable crops in the agribusiness capital of the world are soybeans and corn. Not because individual consumers are willing to pay top dollar for corn and soy at the grocery store, but because those are the most readily commodified and synthesized plants. But to grow those crops, and more importantly, to make any money selling their harvest, farmers must get bigger while getting simpler. A vicious spiral that leaves big monocrop farms vulnerable to pests, floods, and weather shifts. Over the last 40 years in the United States, the number of small farms and mid-sized farms has shrunk while the amount of large farms has grown. Part of this consolidation is due to farmers retiring as the average age of the American farmer continues to get older and older. But older farmers aren't passing off land to younger farmers. Instead, they're selling it to investors and speculators or larger farms, creating a consolidation effect that further increases the barrier to entry. Larger farms are able to maximize their profits with massive harvests. They can outcompete smaller farms through data analytics and $500,000 GPS-driven harvesters. Farmers aren't growing more acres because they enjoy it or are buying herbicide-resistant GMOs because that's what tastes good. They're doing it because that's the best way to turn a profit within the system they're locked into. As one Iowa farmer, Seth Watkins, notes in an interview with Inside Climate News, I don't think any of us wants to get bigger. It's just the curse of a commodity business. We made all the focus on production and all the economics, the subsidies are tied to production. We have a production focused agriculture policy. And all of this consolidation and simplification means that the industrial processes of pummeling soil with nitrogen fertilizer, pesticides, and planting just a few crops are cementing industrial farming as the way to farm which means that climate initiatives or ecological farming techniques face a massive uphill battle to be implemented. At the end of the day, industrial farming is focused on one thing, yields for profit, a goal that runs directly counter to the path agriculture should be taking in light of the climate crisis. Because farming has the power to turn back the tide of emissions. It has the power to foster biodiverse and thriving landscapes. And as we will soon see, it's done the exact opposite. For modern farmers, specialization is king. Whether it's year-round strawberry production in California or corn production on the plains of Iowa, farmers know that concentrating on just one or two crops allows them a competitive edge in a capitalist system. It means they can justify purchasing crop-specific expensive equipment to save time and finely tune a monocrop farm system to maximize profit margins. We are no longer in an age where farmers grow food for themselves and their regional community. They now must sell their crops on the global market. Nearly three decades ago in the US, only 33% of corn sales came from farms harvesting just two crops. In short, farms were much more diverse. In just 30 years, however, that percentage has grown to 53%. Farms are increasingly growing just one or two crops. This specialization and concentration has disastrous environmental consequences. Alongside the devastating emissions from synthetic nitrogen fertilizers, U.S. farm production itself, like the energy consumption for combines or tractors, produces 68.2 million tons of greenhouse gas equivalent every year. And to add insult to injury, healthy soils have the capacity to capture and store carbon dioxide. Yet large-scale industrial agriculture has blasted that capacity to smithereens. Under the current extractive monocrop paradigm, which plants just a couple of crops over and over again in the same field using tillers and chemical fertilizers to prep the soil, nutrients and organic matter quickly disappear. As a result, the soil soon becomes barren, no longer a beneficial environment for plants to thrive. 
Left unprotected for months on end, this dead dirt gets swept away by wind and rain, stripping even more minerals and nutrients that have been built up over decades if not centuries. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization predicts that this constant damage will push 90% of the Earth's topsoil to be at risk by 2050. With a recent study projecting that soil erosion in the US is on track to repeat Dust Bowl era losses eight times over. Under these degraded and dead conditions, soils aren't able to capture carbon, leading to a massive opportunity for emissions drawdown wasted in the pursuit of profit accumulation. And dead soil not only means worse crop yields and less carbon capture, but also less biodiversity. As we carve up more land for soybeans for animal feed, like in the case of the Brazilian Amazon, or till prairie land into more fields of corn, previously diverse habitats become deserts of monocrops, inhospitable to insects and birds desperate for a home. In part, this is because as farms get bigger, so too has industrial pesticide use, especially in the wake of chemically resistant strains of GMO seeds. Pesticide use has almost doubled since 1990, because as soil degrades under the plow of capitalist production, farmers douse their plants in herbicides and insecticides in an ever-increasing arms race against weeds and pests. Once farmers begin to spray their crops, weeds and pests build resistance and more and more chemicals are needed. And these excess chemicals don't just stay on the farm, they slip into our waterways, harm farm workers, and reach into our wells and food. One study found that 80% of Americans have detectable levels of pesticides or their byproducts in their bodies. And about 385 million cases of pesticide poisoning are reported every year, most of which come from farm workers in close contact with toxic chemicals poured onto fields. While studies like this and this reveal that birds and wildlife have now become collateral damage in the hunt to produce the maximum amount of commodity crops. The silent spring that Rachel Carson grieved for in the 1960s is still very much happening today and is driven by the logic of capitalism demanding monocultural production. Monocultures which are highly susceptible to failure in the face of hardship hardship which will certainly come with a growing climate crisis. Because farming under a profit-based system is a high-stakes gamble. To get the most from your field, it's best to plant just one crop. But if a hailstorm or a wave of pests flattens your 1,000 acres of corn, you've lost it all. All your chips are stacked onto one bet. And if it doesn't pan out, it can mean bankruptcy and ruin a fact which looms over the increasing rate of suicide amongst farmers in the US, a rate which is now 3.5 times higher than the general population. So under capitalism, farming kills the soil, kills plants, kills wildlife, and kills people. We desperately need an intervention. We need a means of farming that focuses not on commodity production for profit, but instead growing food for nourishment and biodiversity. Long before there was the Harvest Combine or Kip Tom's GPS tracking devices, Karl Marx declared that capitalist agriculture was already steeped in the co-exploitation of workers and nature. He writes in the third volume of Capital, All progress in capitalist agriculture is a progress in the art not only of robbing the worker, but of robbing the soil. As the years march on from when Marx penned those words, they only became more prescient. Capitalist agriculture is driving us into an increasingly fragile food system that prioritizes commodity production over food, degrades soil, endangers wildlife, and drives climate change. But as much as our food system today is a snapshot of the destructiveness of capitalist extraction, food and farming has the potential to be the exact opposite. Agriculture has the ability to create resilient communities, foster thriving biodiverse landscapes, capture carbon, and turn back the tide of climate change all while growing delicious food. And it all starts with an emphasis on diversification. There is no one correct way to farm. Growing food well means paying attention to and understanding your local environment. But regardless of locations, we can't continue on with monocultural production. We must embrace a farm of many plants, a polyculture that builds resiliency through diversity. But just changing what crops we grow or how many crops we grow is not enough. So what would it mean if agriculture actually focused on growing food for people and the planet instead of growing products for market? Completely transforming our food system won't happen overnight, but we can take steps right now to minimize the damage of crop production. Immediate interventions within our current systems could look like replacing synthetic fertilizer 
fertilizers with green manures, cover cropping, and crop rotation strategies. In addition, growing the number of community-supported agriculture, or CSA, farms will be crucial. CSAs are a small glimpse of what farms might look like under a biodiverse socialist farming system, one where farmers and community members are directly tied to each other. Both are invested in the success of the farm's capacity to create a wide range of good and tasty food. Today, CSAs not only provide farmers with needed financial backing early on in the growing season, which is crucial in our current food system, but it also develops the surrounding community's knowledge about what's seasonal and what it takes to run a farm. But CSAs are ultimately limited in their scope under capitalism. There are over 7,000 CSA-based farms in the U.S. alone, yet commodity crop production still dominates agriculture. So what would a food system beyond capitalist agricultural production even look like? One vision comes from Max Isle in his book A People's Green New Deal. There he envisions farms accompanied by cities and urban centers adorned with gardens. Every home and street-lined boulevard, rooftop, facade, brown lots should be a communist victory garden. This urban agriculture is already happening in cities like Havana and Cuba, which produces roughly 70% of the city's fruit and vegetable needs on site showing us the possibility and power of collective and community gardens held in common. But we will also need to grow staple grains, and yes, even corn and soybean. But crucially, these crops must not fall back into the old ways of 20,000 acres of fields and the same crop. In a biodiverse farming system, democratic planning will be an essential task. One where local and regional communities will work with farmers to grow the food that's needed instead of producing as much as possible for profit. A system that might set carbon capture goals for farmers while also giving them the tools and the training to create a thriving biodiverse farm allowing them to grow corn but interspersing those plants with cover crop regimes or other agroecological methods. This might mean foregoing some labor-saving devices. Kip Tom's GPS-guided combine harvester might not be appropriate for the task of a farm with a multitude of crops. But ecological farming methods don't necessarily have to mean millions of people toiling away in fields. There are so many labor-saving technologies appropriate for every size of farm already being implemented. An eco-socialist food system doesn't mean heading back into the Stone Age. What it means is putting food and the people who grow it at the center of planning, policy, and community. It means doing the rational thing and growing food for people and not for money. Because the food we put on our plates three times a day can be tied to a system that has the potential to heal ourselves, our community, and our planet. And sadly, instead, we're locked into a system that's origins trace back to the capitalist industrial revolution of 18th century England. That is where fossil fuels latched on to the forces of capitalist production and handed capitalism and fossil fuels the reins to our world. The origins and birth of fossil fuels are often simplified and misunderstood, which is exactly why in next month's video, I look at exactly why fossil fuels became the dominant fuel source for our world, despite its cost, its energy capacity, and other drawbacks. How did steam and ultimately the fossil fuels that powered it win the historical battle of energy? And because of the generous support of Nebula members, you can watch that video a month early right now on the creator-owned streaming service Nebula. There you can also watch over 25 bonus and extended OCC videos alongside a ton of other exclusive content from creators like Second Thought, Not Just Bikes, and Real Life Lore. I've learned so much about the rise of fascism in Second Thought's Nebula original series F is for Fascism. August 1945 marked the definitive end of the fascist era, but not the end of fascism. And I also highly recommend watching City Beautiful's original video on the origins of Shanghai's massive public transit system. There is no doubt that the rise of Shanghai as a global megacity is completely intertwined with the growth of its metro system. And on top of all that, Nebula has a whole host of classes from creators like Simon Clark. But how do we actually tell that story in an effective way? And Tom Nichols. How to research like a PhD student which have definitely upped my video making and storytelling skills. Signing up for Nebula using my link is the best way to support our changing climate. It's like Patreon combined with Netflix, 
but better for me and you. And I've got an exclusive deal for you right now. If you sign up for Nebula using the link on screen or in the description, you can get 40% off per year, which is just $2.50 a month. Signing up for Nebula is the single best way to support our changing climate. And in the process, you can watch my videos a month early, get access to all my ad-free exclusive videos, and support a blossoming collective of educational creators.